okay so here today we're looking at the the transport implants in biology this is biology chapter seven the transport implants sorry the transporting animals so we're looking at the transporting the animals okay we're looking at the transport in the animals so without wasting time let's begin now when you're talking about transporting animals uh we will be talking about the circulatory system we'll be talking about the circulatory system you know the circulatory system is a system that helps to move the blood and the nutrients from one place or one part of the body to another part of the body from the heart to the rest of the body to the lungs to every other part of the body and we're going to look at the channel through which this blood and nutrients and water and every other thing that moves with it we're going to look at the channel with which this uh, happens with which this blood and nutrients and water and water whatever that is being moved about we're going to look at the channel through which this movement takes place and we're going to look at the organs that support this movement okay so the first and foremost thing is the circulatory system now we say the circulatory system is a system of blood vessels the blood vessels are like the channels through which the blood flows through right so with, uh, it's a system that's made up of the blood vessels with a pump and a valve to ensure one way flow of the blood so the circulatory system helps us to uh, cl uh, classify or categorize the blood vessels that's the channel through which the blood flows so it's it deals with the the, the main organ which is the heart the heart the the blood vessels the blood the pump and the valves the essence of the valve is to ensure that the blood do not flow backward it only can go in one direction only so that's the essence of the uh, valve the pump is to ensure the heart is to ensure that the bomb is uh, the blood is being pumped from that position or location to every other part of the body okay now the when we use a red color or red arrow we're showing the flow of oxygenated blood when we use a blue one we're saying or symbolizing a deoxygenated blood so every part of the heart when we want to look at the heart the pump the heart the heart is the center of the the circulatory system just like what the brain is the brain is in the nervous system the brain and the spinal cord what they are in the nervous system is what the heart is to the circulatory system the heart is the the center the epic center of the circulatory system everything starts and ends with it everything starts from the heart the flow of the blood the pumping of the of the blood to the rest of the body starts from the heart and comes back to the heart so the heart is a, a fun chaba entity and we're going to look at it and it's usually called double circulation the heart or the circulatory system found in humans are usually called double circulation because they have two closure the first closure is from the heart to the rest of the body and the second closure is from the heart to the lungs so it's a two-way circles that uh, that's the reason why we call it uh, double circulation now if you take a look at this we we'll draw the symbol of the heart to illustrate the flow of the blood as it were if you look at here the blood is pumped from here from the this uh, uh, right uh, ventricle the blood is pumped to the lungs deoxygenated blood the blue blood is the deoxygenated blood is pumped to the lungs through what through the pulmonary artery remember the blood leaves the heart from the artery the blood takes uh, the, the the blood is taken away from the heart through the arteries and the blood is brought back to the heart through the vein the blood is blood brought back to the heart through the vein okay now uh, from the heart to the lungs a deoxygenated blood is sent the blood without oxygen a blood that contains carbon dioxide is sent to the lungs on getting the lungs it diffuses this carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli from the red blood cells and then in exchange oxygen is uh, given 
oxygen that uses from the alveoli to the red blood cells. So it's like gaseous exchange, you know. Gas is being exchanged. You give me oxygen, I give you carbon dioxide. So the oxygen that the, we breathe in through our nose that goes into the through the respiratory system and goes to the brochures and brochures and then eventually to the alveoli, which is like the air sac in the body, that oxygen or air is being taken in. It diffuses into the red blood cells and the carbon dioxide diffuses into the, uh, the, the alveoli. And that carbon dioxide is breathed out by us. And then the oxygen that diffuses inside now goes into the heart. So once oxygen mixed with the blood in the red blood cells, it becomes what? Red, becomes red. Oxygen, which uh, by virtue of hemoglobin, now becomes red because of this pigment, hemoglobin. So it becomes red and this blood is brought back to the heart through what we call the pulmonary veins. Remember everything that comes to the heart is a vein. In this case, this vein is called the pulmonary veins. So please stay, pay attention because in the exams, in biology exams, they might draw for you, they want you to labor and give the functions of each of them. So this is the pulmonary vein that brings the oxygenated blood back to the heart. Now when the blood gets to the heart, it enters through the, through the left atrium, then down to the left ventricle. Remember, this part is called the left, okay? Although when it's facing us, it looks like the right. It looks like the right, but this is the left, and this other side is the right. So it comes in here through the left atrium, then down to left ventricle. Then from the left ventricle, the blood is sent through the biggest artery in the body called the outer. The blood is sent to the rest, the oxygenated blood, the blood that contains oxygen that the, our cells, our body cells need, is sent, sent through the biggest artery, and that biggest artery is called the outer. Now this outer takes the blood to the rest of the body cells. When you get here, here is called the rest of the body, and it's made up of a network of capillaries. Capillaries is another blood vessel. You know, we've talked about uh, artery now. Artery is one of the blood vessels that carries the blood from away from the heart. Artery is one of the blood vessels that carries the blood away from the heart. Usually for, for the, from the heart to the rest of the body, or probably to the rest of the body cells, it, goes, uh, it carries oxygenated blood through the biggest outer and then to the rest of the body cells. Now the body cells, it diffuses into the cells and the cells makes use of the oxygen and the nutrient and the water and whatever it is. Now when the body uh, has used it, then carbon dioxide is produced. That carbon dioxide is sent to, from the body cells to the, to the, the next artery or to, to the next uh, blood vessel, sorry, to the next blood vessels. And that can only happen when there is a, 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 a connection or a connector that connects from the artery to the vein. That is called the capillary. And it's made up of networks of capi capillary. It's made up of uh, networks of capillaries. Now this carbon dioxide diffuses to the capillary, then from capillary diffuses to the vein. This is called the vein, the vena cava. The biggest vein is the vena cava. In here, there, is, there are valves that do not enable the blood to flow back. The vein is wider. The walls of the vein, uh, the, the artery has thick wall cells. The vein has, uh, we've looked at this before, the vein has a wider, a wider path to flow, for the blood to flow. Uh, it has thin wall cells, but a wider uh, way for the blood to go back, the deoxygenated blood to return back to the heart. When it gets to the heart, this blood is again sent to the lungs. This deoxygenated blood is not good for us. So it's again sent to the lungs, uh, lungs uh, in order to give it, up, give it up and pick up of oxygen, uh, which later comes back. So this is the preliminary. This is what is happening in the pumping of the blood and in the circulation of the blood, okay? So I think we get this first part. Can we move on quickly for the sake of time? Let's move on quickly, right? Yes.
Now let's take a look at other mammals. Now we've talked about or uh, other uh, like fish, other smaller uh, organisms that are normal that are normal or they belong to another group of classification that have single circulation. That have just a single circulation. They don't have a double circulation, just like in the case of human beings. Let's this we, we just glance through this a little bit. Okay, and we try to move, move as much as we can. Okay, circulatory system in fish. Let's take a look at circulatory system in fish. Now, we say fish, they have a two-chamber heart and a single circulation. We, human beings, all of us, we have a four-chamber heart and we have double circulation. We have four chamber. We have the left ventricle, the left atrium, then we have the right ventricle and we have the right atrium for us human beings. So we have four, cham four chambers and double circulation. For fish, they have two chambers and they have a single circulation. Is that okay? For fishes, they have two chambers and they have a single circulation. Okay? So you can see their chamber entities. One here in the gill area and another in the body area. So this one they have, uh, they have one circulation and they have two chambers, sorry. They have one chamber, the ventricle, only one ventricle and one atrium here. Okay? Here. They have one ventricle and they have one atrium. They have one ventricle and they have one atrium for fish. Okay? So this is it. Now let's take a look at it. Before we get here, let's give the preliminary background. Now, what this means that they have two chambers and they have one atrium and one nurse and they have single circulation. What it means is that for every one circuit of the body, the blood passes through the heart once. The blood passes through the heart once. That's why it's one circulation. For human being, the blood passes how many times? Twice. First, from the rest of the body comes to the heart. From the heart, it goes to the lungs. From the lungs, it comes back again. Oxygenated blood comes back again to the heart. So it's twice. The blood is coming for human beings. The blood is coming to the heart twice. That's why it's called double circulation. For fishes, the blood is only going to pass through this place only once. This is where the gills is, or what you call the heart. But it's not called heart for fish. We call it the fish, they use the gills. They use the gills. So the gills is what they use. And they have a ventricle and an atrium. They have a ventricle and atrium. So blood only goes like this comes back and then come here once every circulation only one time blood comes to the the gills is that okay now let's take a look at these are gills capillaries these are gills, the capillaries in the gills okay gill circulation this is the circulation in the gills now here you see this is the rest of the body systematic body circulation with the network of capillaries as well this side is the vein from the body, the vein, the blood goes to the, the gills or the heart area. And then from here, it moves to, from the atrium to the ventricle of the chamber of the heart. Okay, you remember we say it's two chamber. For human beings, four chambers. So we, human beings, we have two ventricles, one left, one right. And we have two atrium, two atra. The plural is atra, singular is atrium. We have two, uh, uh, two atra, one left, one right for human beings. But for fish... Only one atrium and one ventricle. Only one atrium and one ventricle. So the blood flows through this heart, which is a two-chamber case, and then passes through the outer, the artery. Okay, passes through the artery to the gill, gill capillary area. So here, the, from the vein or from the artery, the blood uh, gets the oxygen that they breathe in. You know, they get oxygen from their lungs, the gills is part of the lungs, right? Instead of saying lungs, the fish, they use the gills. They don't have nose like us or have uh, the lungs like us. Theirs is called gills. They breathe in oxygen. When the oxygen is mixed with the heart, or mi sorry, when the oxygen is mixed with the blood in the, in the network of uh, capillary of gills, then it becomes oxygenated blood. That oxygenated blood flows to the, all the rest of the body of the fish. And then all the rest of the body gets oxygen 
and they're able to live properly because we need oxygen for survival. Once oxygen stops your body, you pass away. Okay? So this oxygen, it gives you to the rest of the body and get lost and then picks up carbon dioxide, which is again brought to the heart. The heart. So the heart of the fish, the lower part, which is the atrium, the deoxygenated blood follows the vein to the heart. So when it, when the blood is leaving the vein to go to the gills area, it picks the it continues with the same deoxygenated blood to go to the gills area where it will pick up ox, pick up oxygen again. So this is a single circulation with two chamber, two chamber and a single circulation. Is that okay? Now let's take a look at the circulation. Let's take a look at the circulatory system in mammals. Again, once again, I think we've we've uh, itemized, we've explained this, right? In mammals, mammals have four chamber heart. We have, I've explained this, and they have double circulation, right? We've explained this, and then we say what it means is that for every uh, every one the circuit of the body, the blood passes through the heart twice. How how does the blood passes through the heart twi twice? First of all, the blood from the right ventricle goes through the pulmonary artery, it goes to the lungs. From the lungs it picks up, you know it's carrying carbon dioxide, it gives up carbon dioxide and picks up oxygen in the lungs. Then the moment it picks up oxygen, it becomes oxygenated blood. And oxygenated blood have hemoglobin, a thick substance called the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, which makes them uh, blue. And that uh, oxygen come, brings the blood with oxygen to the heart through the uh, left atrium into the left ventricle. Okay, there are four chambers here. You can break this t this one that looks like this circle into four. There are four chambers in the heart. One is the uh, left atrium, and then the bottom one is the left ventricle. This one is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle. Okay, so. Then from here, the blood goes from the at, uh, atrium, the valve will open, and then it goes to the ventricle. From the ventricle, it passes through the biggest auto, the biggest artery called the auto, to the rest of the body. Okay, the artery is one of the, the blood vessels, the vein is one of the blood vessels, and the capillaries are another blood vessels. So there are three blood vessels in the blood circulations. One is the artery, the second one is the vein, and the third one is the capillary. Now, there are different types of arteries, depending on which function. The arteries that leave the heart to the rest of the body is called the auto. And the artery that leaves the heart to the lungs is called the pulmonary artery. Okay, so that's that for that. We've explained this already. Now, let's take a look at some of the points that we have itemized. Now, the right side of the heart receive the oxygenated blood from the uh, from the body and pops it to the lungs because the oxygenated blood is blood that contains carbon dioxide without oxygen oxygen has been used up by the body cells so it's carrying carbon dioxide and that blood needs to quickly be pumped to the lungs and that carbon dioxide needs to be given to the lungs to be exchanged out to breathe to be breathed out then the oxygen that the the, the lungs has it will give it to the blood to di uh, diffuse it to the red blood cells and then brought back to the heart. Okay, be brought back to the heart. Is that okay? So this is what is happening, four chambers and two circ double circulation. Now let's take a look at the advantages of double circulation. What advantage does uh, this have over single circulation? What advantage does the double circulation has over a single circulation? Number one is that blood is traveling through the small capillaries in the lungs and then it loses a lot of pressure that was given to it by the pumping of the heart, meaning it can no longer, it cannot travel as fast as it could. <coughs> so, meaning it has to be brought back to the heart to gain that pressure again in order to go to the rest of the body. Or like in single circulation, the pressure was used to pump the blood, it goes to the gills, and then, when it's now returning, it will not have such a great pressure again to go to the rest of the body, or like in the double circulation. In the double circulation, first of all, pressure was used, pressure was used to pop the heart, to pop the blood from the left, uh, right ventricle to the lungs, 
Okay, when it gets to the lungs, after the exchange and uh, getting oxygen and making it uh, oxygenated blood, this blood will no longer have that uh, because the lungs does not pump it. It doesn't have that pressure again to move. So it's not uh, if if it's not be pumped again, it will move too slowly, or may not even be able to move at all. So one of the advantages of double circulation is that it gets this, the blood gets a chance to be pumped a second time after returning from, returning from the lungs to be pumped a second time to the rest of the body cells, where the oxygen will be used up, where the oxygen will be used up, and carbon dioxide will be given to it to be returned back to the heart. Is that okay? Why do we, do we need this pumping? The reason is that the reason is singularly that the, 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 the passage of the arteries are very thin. They're not na they're, they're very narrow, they're not wide, or like the veins. The veins you don't need to pump blood into it, it will just flow. The vein only has a valve, so that because it's very open for blood to flow through, flow through it. So when the blood gets to a certain level, the valve, when it's coming, it will open. Once it passes, it closes. Okay, for vein, because it's wide. The road is very wide. But for artery, the passage the, of the blood, blood is through a very narrow path. So you need a high pressure to push, to push it through. It needs a high pressure to push it through. So if it's a single circulation, if the blood is pumped to the gills, in the case of fish, and then it exchanges uh, carbon dioxide with oxygen, in returning, the gills do not have that pumping capability to pump it. So it starts coming so slowly. Okay? But in the case of double circulation, it returns back to the heart, and the blood is again pushed and pumped with high pressure to move to the rest of the body cells with the oxygenated blood. So that gives it a super advantage. Is that okay? Is it clear? Yeah. Now let's take a look at another point that makes it stand out, the double circulation, outclass the single circulation. The second point to note is by returning the blood to the heart after going through the lungs, its pressure can be raised again before sending it to the body. I've already explained this also. So kind of I've explained the both advantages. Is that okay? So let's go to the next section. Now let's take a look at the mammalian heart. Okay? Let's take a look at the heart. We're going to look at the heart now. Heart per se, not the whole uh, circulation, circulation thing. So we're going to look at the heart. Okay? Now, the heart is a wonderful mechanism created by, by Almighty Creator. Right? It's a very wonderful mechanism. It has no bone. It's made up of muscles. It's just made up of muscles. And this muscle can contract and expand and relax. And uh, has ability to pump. Has an ability to pump blood. And has an ability to contract and relax. Contract and relax. Contract and relax. It has this capability. So it keep pumping and has a pulse rate. Uh, per seconds. Okay, so let's take a look at the heart. The, the mammalian heart uh, is labeled as we go to look at it or as we showing in this diagram, right? So we're showing in this diagram. So the heart is labeled as if it was the chest, okay? As if it was in the chest. So what is left on the diagram is actually the right side and vice versa. So wherever you see the, in the diagram, the part we call, you know, when you look at it, the part you look and you say, oh, this one, why did they put the right? It's supposed to be the left, right? If you look at this diagram, they call this side the right, this way. You'll be wondering, oh, this way is supposed to be the left, right? And this way is supposed to be the right, right? But remember, you, the heart is actually like this, but you're looking at like this, like a mirror. Like you're looking at something from a mirror, right? So it's like laterally inverted. It's laterally inverted in physics. When you look at physics concept, concept to look at it, so it's laterally inverted. So I think I've clarified that point. Why it's looking the way it's looking? Why we put the right on the left side and we put the left, the the left on the right side? So that concept has been explained because it's laterally inverted. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Then, the right side of the heart receives the oxygenated blood. Look at the right side. It's the one that receives the deoxygenated blood, the blood that is coming from the rest of the body cells through the vena cava. Okay? Here, through the vena cava. It receives the the deoxygenated blood. The deoxygenated blood. Now, this deoxygenated blood is the blood that carries carbon dioxide without oxygen. So, this blood needs to be quickly pumped and sent to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. Through the pulmonary artery. Please take your note. Take note of this diagram. It's in your in your Cambridge exams. Okay, so it, the blood is being pumped through the uh, through to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. Is that okay? Then this blood, after it's uh, it goes to the lungs, it gives the lungs the carbon dioxide and breathes. In exchange, it takes it picks up oxygen, and then this oxygen, like I said earlier on, it diffuses into the the red blood cells, and then through the pulmonary vein, it returns back to the heart on the left side. Now it enters through the left atrium. It enters into the heart through the left atrium. So if you look at, there are four chambers of the heart. One, this one, left atrium, one chamber, and then this is the left ventricle, second chamber, then this is the right ventricle, third chamber, this is right atrium, fourth chamber. So the heart in, mam in mammals it has four chambers. The left atrium, left ventricle, uh, right ventricle and right atrium. So these are the four chambers. So when the blood gets here, then it will move into this place, okay, into the biggest artery called the, the outer, which takes the blood to the rest of the body. So what you see here is the, the heart, the mammalian heart, and the label of it, of every part of it. Here there is a valve. This valve, on the valve, when the blood, the deoxygenated blood enters here, this valve closes so that the blood does not flow back. So it closes so that the blood can only move this direction. If you open here, the blood moves here through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Okay, to give up the uh, ox uh, the blood with the carbon dioxide and picks blood with oxygen, comes with the oxygenated blood. Remember when we say oxygenated blood, we mean the blood with oxygen, that contains oxygen. When we say deoxygenated blood, the blood without oxygen. Blood without oxygen. Is that okay? Blood without oxygen. Is that okay? Now, the left side of the heart receives oxygenated blood. Now, where is the left side? This way. Remember, we said the right is the left. The right is the left. The left side, this way. This way. Okay, which is this way. This other side. This whole chambers. These two chambers. Atrum. Left atrium and right atrium, uh, uh, left atrium and left ventricle. These are all the left side. So the left side, they receive the oxygenated blood from the body, right? The, the left side, so the, from the lungs, right? The left side of the heart receive oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it to the rest of the body. They receive oxygenated blood from the lungs and then they pump pump this blood to the rest of the body through the biggest artery called the outer. Through the biggest artery called the outer. Is that okay? Then the blood is pumped towards the... The blood is pumped towards the heart in veins and away from the heart in arteries. So the blood that comes to the heart is through the veins. The blood that leaves the heart is through the arteries. So the heart, there are two connecting... Uh, cap, uh, blood vessels, the arteries, which takes the blood away from the blood away from the heart, and the veins, which brings the blood to the heart. Then the two sides of the heart are separated by a muscle called the septum. You need to know this; it's in your biology exam. Septum. This place that separates the, these two sides of the heart is called septum. It's called septum. Can we find it? They label that septum. This way, this place. Do you see septum in this labeling? Okay, but this place is called septum. That separate the septum separates this way, this whole long part. This whole long part. What's co what color is this? 
Okay, peach or reddish peach. Yeah. Okay. This color separate, this one separate, it's called septum. It separates the two sides of the heart. Is that okay? Separates the two sides of the heart. Now, the heart is made up of muscle tissues, which are supplied with blood by the coronary arteries. The heart itself, okay, is made, the, apart from sending blood to the rest of the body, it gives blood to itself. Okay, the heart gives blood to itself, yes. It gives blood to itself. And uh, if you have, when they say you have heart problem, meaning your coronary arteries have problem, or your coronary vein, the, the, the blood vessels that supply blood to your heart muscles, once they have problem, when, when they are blocked, you have heart attack. You can have heart attack. Because the heart itself needs the supply of oxygenated blood. The heart itself, needs the supply of uh, oxygenated blood. So once the most, the, 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 these uh, coronary arteries that supplies blood to the heart muscles are blocked, or anything happens to them, then we can have what we call heart, heart attack or other heart diseases. Or although heart diseases can accumulate from that. Is that okay? Now let's move on quickly. Next one. Okay, monetary activity of the heart. Let's take a look at this briefly and we can jump past this place. The heart activity can be monitored by using what we call ECG. Okay, you can monitor the heart activity, what is going on, eyes beating, the pulse rate, everything, and uh, whether the hope no heart issues or heart diseases can be done with what we call a machine called electrocardiogram. Okay, ECG. Now, this ECG, they measure the pulse rate, or they're listening to the sounds of the valves closing using the testoscope. This is the testoscope. They listen to the sound of the valve as they closing and opening, closing and opening. Okay, so this is the testoscope, or the, what we call the pulse rate. ECG is electrocardiogram, uh, used to measure the pulse rate. Is that okay? Now, heart rates and the pulse rate obviously is measured in beats per minute beat per minute we measure the heart rate in beats per minute okay how many beats boom 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 in one minute how many beats in one minute how many beats we can count so the machine counts the number of beats in one minute number of beats in one minute is that okay the machine counts number of beats per minute now to investigate the effect of exercise on the heart rate record the the pulse rate at rest for a minute so we record first of all when you are resting you're not doing any exercise we record your pulse rate for a minute so in one minute how many how many beats can can we count in one minute okay maybe 60 beats per minute or 70 beats i think we normally have 70 beats per minute when you are at rest okay so but then to find the effect of exercise we will now carry out an exercise and then we measure the number of beats per minute. Okay? Now, immediately after we do some exercise, we record the pulse rate every minute or the, it returns to the resting rate that we used to have. Maybe 70 beats per minute. Okay? So, when we do exercise, maybe we can have 200 beats per minute depending on how, the, how intense the exercise was. Maybe you, you're not counting 500 beats per minute. Or 1,000 beats per minute, depending on how intense the exercise was. So we keep recording it till we return back. So you know, after a while, then you as you're breathing, <laughs> after a while, your breathing will return back to normal after you rested for a while after your exercise. So till your counting returns to normal, then we will now see the difference. This experiment to show that during exercise that the heart rate increases. And may take several minutes to return to normal. So the whole exercise is to show how <coughs> how many minutes it takes after exercise to return the rate heart rate to normal.
Now, invest investigating the effect of physical activity on the heart rate. Okay, so we, here we're looking at the effect of physical activities, the th physical things that you do, how, how they affect our rate. Now, it's relatively simple to investigate the effect of the exercise on the body in the classroom, right? We can do this in the classroom. Now, breathing rate can be measured by counting the number of uh, breaths per minute. Number of breath you take per minute. Why heart rate? That's for breathing rate. If you want to measure the breathing rate, you count the number of breath per minute. If you want to measure the heart rate, you do that by measuring the, just measure the pulse. You know the pulse is the beat rate, beat per minute, the number of beat. You measure the pulse and that tells you the number of beat per minute. So either can be measured using, using, can be measured before and after an activity is performed. So in order to benchmark, before you do any activity, you have to measure your breathing rate by your number of beat per minute and you have to measure your heart rate by your number of uh, a bit breathing rate by the number of breath per minute and then your heart rate by your number of uh, beats per minute or pulse rate or your pulse measure your pulse so when we do this we do before we do the exercise we do the measurement and then we do the measurement also after the exercise and we also wait and see how long it takes to return to the normal one before we did the, the we did the exercise is that okay so we can plot the result we get from here, we can plot them in a graph. So it's important that the time over which the breathing rate and the pulse rate are measured is consistent. It's very important that it's consistent. Then it shows you are heavy. If you're not consistent, probably maybe something is wrong somewhere. And that the individual is, has fully recovered or rested before starting a new activity. Before you start a new activity, you have to return back to your normal rate. Increased physical activity results in an increased heart rate and breathing rate. If you increase your physical activity, your heart rate will increase and your breathing rate will also increase. Heart rate remains high for a period of time after physical, has, uh, physical activity has been stopped. And there's a gradual return to the resting heart rate if you stop your exercise. Okay? Now let's take a look at the coronary heart disease. What, kind of, what are the kind of diseases that we can get? The coronary heart disease. You know, I told you one of the diseases that cause coronary heart disease is when the coronary heart uh, artery or the coronary, the coronary artery can no longer supply blood to the heart muscles. When there is a failure of uh, supply of blood to the heart muscles result to coronary heart disease so we already know the label of the heart like you see here but here you see a different thing that has been included which is the left coronary artery this one the one supplying to the heart muscles on the left side and the one supply the right coronary artery the one supplying uh, to the right muscles the right side of the muscles the artery that is supplying blood now the heart is made from cardiac muscles tissues the heart itself is made from cardiac muscles tissues okay these are called the cardiac muscles these ones they are called the cardiac muscle cells these ones they are the cardiac muscle cells coronary artery supplies the cardiac muscle cells with nutrients plus they also help to remove the waste product in this uh, uh, cardiac cells, cardiac muscle cells. So they bring the blood with nutrient. You know, the blood contains nutrient. The food you eat that, that is digested is that you get diffused into the blood. So the, your heart, your heart itself is made up of uh, cardiac muscle cells. These cardiac muscle cells, they need the blood. They also need the nutrient. Now, they also have what we call the waste product. This waste product must be taken away from the coronary heart uh, from these cardiac muscle cells through the coronary veins so if there's a problem that this uh, waste product cannot be taken away away from the heart muscles or these cardiac muscle cells then we start to have what we call one of the problem coronary heart disease 
any of the heart disease. Now, let's take a look at the coronary arteries. The heart is made, made up of uh, muscle cells that need their whole supply of blood to deliver oxygen to them. Not only to deliver oxygen, also has to deliver glucose, your nutrient, and other nutrients. And also remove carbon dioxide and other waste products that are in the cardiac muscle cells. They have to be, be a system in place that takes, that brings oxygen, that brings nutrients, that brings the blood through the coronary arteries to the coronary, uh, the cardiac muscle cells. That's one phase. The second phase is that the waste product, as a result of this, like the carbon dioxide and other waste, other waste product that may be resulting from here, must be taken away from the, the cardiac heart, uh, the cardiac muscle cells. If not, then there will be problem. There will be a lot of issues. The blood is supplied by the coronary arteries. The blood to the heart muscles or the cardiac muscle cells is supplied by the coronary arteries. Now, if the coronary artery gets partially or completely blocked, by fat, fat deposit, called the plugs. The pl plug, the plug blocks your, in fact, these are caused by cholesterol. So that's why it's not good to get, uh, to eat too many fatty acids. The moment your stomach start getting too fat, too fat, there's a problem. Chol a lot of cholesterols are building up in your system and this might block this might cause problem to your heart and start creating heart problems for you so we must do exercise because these are ma mainly caused by cholesterol and cholesterols are coming from food like oil we eat too, too much oil there's a tribe in nigeria called the yoruba people they take a lot of oil not only them many i think africa we eat a lot of oil too much oil causes causes cholesterol and fat fatty food too much fatty food like uh, animal fats like butter margarine these things they when they're not used by the body when they are in excess they cause cholesterol and cholesterol is very dangerous they can cause so many problems they can cause high blood pressure they can cause diabetes and so many things and they can also cause a plague to a fatty deposit to start to block the coronary arteries so that the coronary arteries will not be able to deliver the blood to the uh, cardiac muscle cells. And if it's not able to deliver blood, oxygenated blood, the nutrients to the cardiac, cardiac muscle cells, then there's a huge heart problem that's coming up. There's a big heart problem heart disease that is going to eh, emanate, that is going to come into effect. Is that okay? Partial blockage of the coronary arteries creates a restricted uh, blood flow to the card cardiac muscle cells and result in several chest pains called the uh, angina. So that's partial blockage. So how do we correct this if, if it's still in the early stage? One, you have to do a lot of exercise. Two, you have to eat a lot of fruits. Three, you have to take coffee in the morning. Four, you have to eat a lot of watermelon and concubine. And you have to take nuts, a lot of nuts. You snack with nuts, like, like almond nuts, like peanuts, like all kinds of nuts we help to ease the blood flows, create the, the pathway for the blood to flow to the rest of your body and also to your heart muscles, the cardiac heart muscle cells, okay? But if the problem is already too complicated, then we need the expert of doctors, of medical doctors, to probably carry out heart operation, to open up the, put a mesh to suppress the block, the blockage, the plug, plug and bring it and, and suppress it so that the blood can flow through the arteries to the cardiac muscle cells. Complete blockage means cells in that area of the heart will not be able to 
respire and can no longer contract leading to heart attack to lead to heart attack if it's not quickly solved the problem is not quickly solved to lead to heart attack so we should we should always check our heart how it's doing okay how it's doing and uh, we'll be able to fix that problem okay so uh, what you see here is remember a diet remember a diet too high in saturated fat plus cholesterol can lead to coronary heart disease i, I think i have already explained this concept a diet that is super high with cholesterol or saturated fat can lead to coronary heart disease so we should uh, minimize the way we eat diet with fat reduce your butter intake reduce your mayonnaise reduce your oil reduce your animal fat reduce bomo for those of you from africa in the animal skills that you eat like you call bomo you have to reduce this okay because this adds to uh, causes cholesterol to build up and then this can cause a blockage in the coronary artery and that like once there's a blockage in the coronary artery a plug has occurred and if the blockage is partial we can still do something if it's a total blockage then we will have heart attack okay so that's that a plug is mainly a build up of cholesterol plus white blood cells this is a plug can you take a look at this this is the artery the blood is supposed to pass through this easily now you see a plug is growing here right artery wall becomes less elastic see so the blocking is difficult for the blood to follow here now to the cardiac muscle cells because this yellowish color is a plug is blocking the passageway of the blood and nutrients so when this happens when it's totally blocked then heart attack will start to happen heart failure heart attack and so on and so forth is that okay so coronary arteries narrows restricted blood flows see it gets narrow the coronary artery gets narrowed in not this place is not restrict restricted the flow of blood so we, we here we can do heart operation by putting a mesh to suppress this to suppress so that the blocking flow back again flow through this place again artery wall become less elastic because of this plug that is growing here so this is a serious issue and it needs to be solved it needs to be solved but with operations or with dietary a lifestyle is very important in this regard the food you eat the exercise is all the things the nature nature of the food you eat all these things are super important in order to see you through and prevent heart problems okay so this is a normal artery normal blood flows you see no problem artery wall okay this is a normal artery normal blood flow artery wall this is the narrowing of the artery because this one is not abnormal blood flow it's blocked you see a plug grow here is blocked the blood do not have all the space to flow anymore like here the blood flows here has all the space to flow through you can send them to join again mm -hmm. so the blood flows through here normal blood flow no problem not is blocking it okay here a plug is growing the blood is coming it's not restricted to only climb this mountain and flow through this place only so as this it grows then we are and or we are dying gradually look at it we're di dying gradually narrow artery narrow space for because this is a plug growing so here it was free the artery wall was a uh, block and just flow through it you see everything was free but here there's a plug growing it totally flows through a small narrow part so at the end of the day there's a problem coming leading to coronary heart disease so as this plug is growing the Coronary, art, coronary artery it will lead to coronary heart disease and that might be the end of the human being if care, quick, uh, care is not taken now 
risk factor for coronary heart disease table. One of the things that cause coronary heart disease. Let's quickly go through this. Can you send to them again? Okay. Okay. One of the one of the risk factors is poor diet. You are eating uh, super saturated fat. That will increase your cholesterol level in your body. So please stop eating fatty food. Too much fatty food. That's number one. Poor diet. Number two, stress. When you are under stress, your hormones produce uh, hormones produce can increase your blood pressure. And if your blood pressure increases to be increasing the chance of a blockage in the coronary artery. So please always, when you're under stress, take a break. Yeah, take a travel. When you're under stress, travel, leave the environment. Or take a break. Even if you are not traveling, take a break. Don't, when things are stressing you up, stress can increase your blood pressure. That's what we call high blood pressure, which will cause a blockage in the coronary artery and then problem. Another problem causing uh, coronary heart disease is smoking. So smoke not only the lungs it affects, it also affects the heart. Nicotine in cigarettes will cause blood uh, vessels to become narrower. They will make your blood vessels to narrow and then the blood do not have a big wide area to flow through. There will now start increasing your blood pressure. Blood pressure will increase and the blockage will start to build up. Another problem causing the coronary heart disease is genetic uh, predisposition like this from your gene your history your family history okay you see some family once they have diabetes everyone have diabetes your genetic predisposition is also study shows that people with the history of coronary heart disease in their family are more likely to develop it themselves okay <coughs> if your family normally have heart problem there is high chance that you can even get it okay if you live poor but if you try to work so hard with good diet and eat stress and don't smoke and follow every other thing maybe this one may not be so predominant their age okay the risk of developing coronary heart disease increases as you get older heart problems is usually more with older people than younger people from 40 50 60 70 80 okay then gender Yes, heart problem usually male, the male, men. Male are more likely to develop a coronary heart disease than female. We're not saying female don't have birth, it's more, it's common with men. So if you are a man, please take more care of your heart, of your, don't smoke. See, you can do many of this. You can take care of your diet, stop eating fat, too many fatty things, ease yourself of stress, don't smoke. And then maybe these other two will fall in place. Okay? You can control these three factors. You cannot control the last three. You can control the first three factors. There are six factors okay, that leads to coronary heart disease. Now let's take a look at diet, exercise, and coronary heart disease. The diet, exercise, and coronary heart disease. So reducing the risk of developing coronary heart disease. Okay? Quit smoking. You have to quit smoking. If you want to reduce the risk of getting coronary heart disease, you have to stop smoking, number one. So these are the things you need to do in order to improve your health. Quit smoking. Stop smoking. And don't stay near anyone who smokes. When you are staying near them, you're also a secondhand smoker. Then your diet, reduce animal fat, like momo, like fatty food, uh, animal fat. I eat more of fruits and vegetables. Make your food more of fruits and vegetables. This will reduce cholesterol level in your blood and helps you with the weight loss. Okay? You will not be overweight. So it will help you with weight loss. So please eat more of nuts, fruits, vegetables, green vegetables, oranges, concubine, watermelon. Take those things at each other and drink a lot of water. Okay? Then... Another thing you can do to help yourself is exercise regularly. Again, this will help with the weight loss and decrease your blood pressure and cholesterol level in your system and reduce your stress. When you do exercise, you can reduce your stress. If I, I found one uh, guy who said he does five times in a week. Every week he does serious exercise five times in a week. 
for some of us we don't even do so please try okay i think we should stop here right identify structure in the heart i think we this one uh, we'll be talking about high blood pressure from there high blood pressure is coming from the artery low blood pressure is from the vein okay and uh, is that okay uh, so this one i think you can just look at this okay look at this because my time is uh, over for this class so the functions of the verb the biscopic verb and the trispoc uh, transcopic verb okay okay i think we can start from here next class you take note where we stop we can start from here in our next class N uh, nine point one point seven at the five structure in the in the heart okay so with this we come to the end of uh, today's uh, class thank you